into the sustainability imperative, where we'll discuss the future of sustainability and climate change. I'm Crystal Ball. When we talk about the climate crisis, we often forget an integral component, the economic impact that transitioning to green energy can present for working families and the economy at large. Experts agree that a vital aspect of addressing climate change is transitioning to renewable energy. But how do we guarantee economic security for the country and working people in particular? Today, we're going to focus on some of the ways to ensure reliable jobs for the middle class stay in place while investing in sustainability projects that will help the environment. Here to discuss is Tyson Slocum. He's Energy Program Director for Public Citizen. And so great to have you, Tyson. Yeah, great to be here, Crystal. Of course. So first of all, can you just talk about some of the effects that climate change has right now on working families? Well, obviously, uh, as we emit more and more greenhouse gas emissions, primarily from the burning of fossil fuels, it's warming our planet. And that is resulting in uh, increased and more severe uh, weather activity, particularly storms. So you're talking about hurricanes, you're talking about rising sea levels, you're talking about uh, expanded and extended heat waves, which out west triggers wildfires. And so there's a whole range of issues where uh, Americans are facing these types of exposure to threats uh, here in the U.S. and, of course, globally as well. You focus your coverage a lot on regulation of oil, natural gas, other energy markets, can you, or lack thereof in terms of the lack of regulation. Can you talk about how that negatively impacts families? Absolutely. A, a clear example is what happened in the post-Valentine's Day blackouts in Texas, where when uh, people were deprived access to electricity, they literally died. They literally froze to death. And so access to electricity is literally a life or death issue. And so when we talk about ensuring the reliability of our systems, when we talk about regulating energy, first and foremost, access to electricity and energy is a human rights issue. Uh, that's why back in the 1930s, when Congress passed the Federal Power Act, right in the very beginning of the law, it says that electricity is inherently affected with a public interest. And the problem that we saw in Texas was Texas is totally unique from the rest of the country. Not only does the federal government lack effective jurisdiction over the market, but Texas has relied entirely upon market forces to procure and deliver needed electricity supplies. Rather than in the rest of the country, we've got regulations and mandates that require power plants and other energy providers to deliver needed electricity in Texas. Instead, they relied totally on the market and just kept increasing prices in the hopes that it would become so profitable for generators that that was the reason that they would offer their energy into the market. And obviously, it was a complete disaster. So this experiment with relying on markets alone to incentivize needed investments into energy and importantly, to require that energy producers deliver needed supplies into the market, relying exclusively on markets is a failed experiment. And we need to understand that government must play an essential role in ensuring the procurement of needed energy supplies at affordable prices. And so I think going forward, ensuring that we've got better standards. If you want to be in the energy business, there should be a requirement from the very beginning that you must weatherize your equipment and have all other needed reliability uh, uh, measures in place before you can even turn on your uh, power plant. Uh, and so ensuring federal uh, reliability standards for all parts of the United States that require these reliability uh, initiatives to be in place. That's going to be one of the first things that we do. But then there's there's a bigger issue here, Crystal, and that is democratizing access to decision making in energy. And at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which is the primary federal agency that that oversees most uh, energy markets in the United States, they have initiated a really important proceeding to establish something called an Office of Public Participation. 
they're holding listening uh, sessions all this week. There's a, uh, a formal workshop on April 16th and comments are due to FERC on April 23rd on this office. What this office would do would be to uh, do all it can to encourage the public to participate in federal energy regulatory proceedings. Those are rate filings, those are pipeline proceedings, those are rulemakings. And importantly, the office, the way that it would help the public participate would be to provide what's known as intervener compensation to literally financially compensate public interest groups for their costs associated with participating in regulatory proceedings. This is transformative. You know, forever, utilities have been subsidized for their regulatory activities because uh, for a utility, whether you're an electric company or a gas company, you can recover your costs associated with participating in a regulatory proceeding from ratepayers. Public interest groups, environmental groups, consumer groups, environmental justice groups have never had that opportunity until now. And so I think in addition to talking about uh, uh, mandatory reliability standards for our energy systems, democratizing access by establishing an office of public participation is going to be an essential tool to make sure that uh, when we're designing energy markets, uh, that uh, we have seats at the table for all affected stakeholders. Because, yeah. you know, yeah. one, yeah. That's actually really remarkable and something I didn't know about. Um, you know, one of the innovations in the Green New Deal was really putting a focus on an economic just transition at the center because this is always the charge is, okay, you're going to go to green energy, but all these people who earn their living from the current sector, they're going to suffer. So how do we make sure that that transition goes smoothly, that people aren't being left out in the cold, so to speak, um, literally and figuratively, I guess, as we move into this new green energy economy? Crystal, that's a great question. And, you know, the United States has never protected people during these transitions. We've had these types of disruptive transitions uh, for a long, long time. There's a whole geographic part of the United States that is still called the Rust Belt because we turned our back on the manufacturing centers in Ohio and Indiana when they uh, lost to global competition and we allowed entire regions of the United States to literally turn to rust. So we have never incorporated a just transition before. And it is really heartening to see that this is at the top of policymakers' priorities when we're talking about the green transition to make sure that we are uh, not going to turn our back on these communities. And the way you do that is to uh, uh, make sure that we are investing in Appalachia in West Virginia, that we're investing in the Permian and in the Bakken uh, uh, oil fields, that we do not leave geographic regions behind just because they're still tied to extractive industries. We do have to understand that the disruptions we're seeing uh, are because the economic opportunities with renewable energy uh, are just so fantastic. They are uh, cost effective. In fact, in most energy markets, large scale renewable systems are the least cost uh, energy resource compared to coal uh, and natural gas. And so this isn't just a matter of us choosing a social preference to be green. It's an economic one that renewable energy really is cheaper and it doesn't feature the harmful greenhouse gas emissions uh, like when you burn uh, oil or coal. Uh, but it's very easy to ensure a just transition as long as we commit to retraining workers and to commit to reinvesting in these communities that currently rely on extraction like coal mining or oil drilling. And we try to promote new centers of production uh, in these areas. And finally, Tyson, um the Biden administration, they've rejoined the Paris Climate Accords. They issued some executive orders around climate change, and they promised to make this a focus of his administration. How will you be assessing his record, and what are you hoping to see from the Biden team? 
Right. It's it's great that we're rejoining Paris. We have to also understand that the Paris Climate Accord is really just a starting point. Uh, we have to remember that climate change is global. The United States, we could reduce our emissions to zero and we're not going to solve the climate crisis because it takes collective action by all nations. And that's what the Paris Climate Accord did really for the first time is get every country on Earth, United States and China, together to commit voluntarily to reduce emissions. And the next important phase that we're going to be looking at from the Biden administration is what the next step is, right? All Paris did was get the world to agree to work together to reduce emissions. Now we've got to do the next phase, which is enhancing those commitments, speeding up the uh, delivery of renewable energy, reducing the amount of fossil fuels that we produce, and having some sort of, com of binding commitments so that there's enforceability in case nations do not deliver uh, on their promises to reduce emissions. Tyson, thank you so much. Great to have you. Great to be here. Thank you. My pleasure. And thank you all for watching The Sustainability Imperative. We'll have more for you next time.